work at that touch point where we see some of the most underpaid and overworked professionals in public health. And what we seek to do is give them back capacity by reducing some of the administrative workload which is associated with very common patient pathways. In your opinion, ultimately, uh, what, what kind of problems is AI trying to solve or at least managing to solve in the healthcare? I tell most of my students at the University of Malta that the role of education is to help us think about interesting problems that we can solve. And I think Ebo is blessed with the opportunity to solve two of the largest public healthcare problems that plague our society today. The first problem, Alexei, is access. So Eurostat research shows us that about 52% of all European citizens do not have the level of digital literacy skills to allow them to interact with the overly digitized, overly bureaucratized healthcare platform systems. And this is a problem. You cannot marginalize half your society and push them out of what is ultimately a public good. So what Ebo does, the first problem we solve, is trying to lower the bar of engagement to allow any citizens, whatever their digital maturity and skills, to effectively interact with healthcare. And I think Frizina said something which is key in her introduction, which is when measuring the system, it is not about effectiveness, it's about impact. And that's what we seek to do. We try to relook at society in which public healthcare could be more impactful. The second problem that AI solves and that we focus on in this area is capacity. A really interesting study by the World Health Organization shows that by the end of our decade, we will have 10 million less clinicians than we need to sustain basic healthcare services. Now, this is a problem, and universities cannot solve it in short term. And we believe that this is the role that AI can play in healthcare today. We need to restore capacity back to our overworked clinicians. And artificial intelligence can do that through the blessing of automation to take out robotic, administrative, repetitive, non-value creating activities in pathways and move them out of the healthcare uh, process which is burdened on clinicians. So giving them back time to do what they've studied, what they can do best. So I think tackling access and demand are the two areas that AI focuses on. And in our case, the empowering tool is restoring patient agency. Because when you empower the patient, when you give agency back to the patient, in turn, this does lead to better clinical outcomes. So, so JJ, in, in your opinion, what are the drivers or maybe the blockers no, that is um, uh, holding us back from uh, reaching the patient and giving this technology to, to people? Uh, let's speak about the elephant in the room, right? Um, in general terms, most patients do not trust artificial intelligence. And to move towards a trust-based society in technology you cannot merely improve the technology itself, which we're doing with AI, but we need to radically rethink the concept of patient information. So I think the problem which we have here in adoption, one of the biggest blockers, is in fact the aggrandization of claims about what AI can actually achieve. In order to ensure that patients trust an AI innovation, which is implemented in a hospital, we need to take time and patiently explain the benefits of AI to our patients. Technology moves fast, but the cognition of patients does not, right? So when lives and treatment outcomes are at risk, it is imperative that we ensure transparency, both from technology providers and from healthcare providers. So, I think this brings us to this whole new discussion about AI literacy. We need to take time 
to explain AI concepts to the entire industry. Concepts like classification, concepts like confidence levels, the difficult discussions around ethics, fairness in machine learning, bias, and we have to do that for non technical audiences. And one of my concerns, which emerges from a lot of public policy marketing in European countries, is that the hype which is created around AI in healthcare subsequently hides the tough questions that we need to ask. And it is through these tough questions that you could build trust in an in a way which is open, and perhaps this openness, this principle of openness in AI, brings us to four key elements that we need to ensure occur in every technology implementation. Firstly, that the technology is lawful, it's the basis of operation, but without that, if there isn't respect for the key laws of the country, whether that relates to privacy or other laws, then that's a blocker. The second one is ethics. Ethics is tricky because it is often not codified and it has jurisdictional variations depending on which country and, or continent you're in. But the ethical matching of the solution to the expectations of society. Thirdly, the robustness of the solution. Is it available? Is it repeatable? Does it give outcomes which uh, can be maintained and sustained over time? And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Alexei, an area which I know you worked on a lot personally, is the explainability concept. If we have black boxed AI solutions in healthcare, patients will never relate to them because they can't understand how that outcome has been reached. So I think if we frame the blocker to adoption as being the aggrandization of health, of, of claims, the antidote to that are these four principles, right? Creating trust through lawful AI, through ethical AI, through robust AI, and explainable AI. If we have that in place, I think we've got the right ingredients for adoption. Thank you. JJ, last few seconds. Uh, what does success look like, right? The most important question. I think in a decade from now, success looks like three factors to me. The first is that we will have a society with digital inclusion where we would have lowered the engagement bar for the general public to interact with healthcare services. The second pillar of success for me is health equity, which is granting to society, regardless of their level of skill, regardless to their level of capability access or any other disparities, full and free access to public healthcare. And the third pillar of success, what good looks like to me in a decade from now, is patient centricity, is building an entire suite of tools and services and clinical pathways which end to end have the patient and not the system at their core center. That's what good looks like in 2033. Thank you very much. That was all. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa.